All right, well, it was part two. I got cut off on my other video. So talking about family, I guess. Um, you know, for me, when I was in my last marriage, I didn't know that I had any issues or that I needed any help. I think it's how I left it off. Um, and that resulted in, you know, again, I think just not being in a great place emotionally when I was married before. And um, I think it was very hard on my ex-wife. She ended up doing some stuff that was very inappropriate, which resulted in the demise of the marriage. But as far as my part in it, which I think it's important whenever you go through a divorce and anybody that's out there that's listening to this, is it's, it's, it takes two to tango. Even if, even if um, your spouse has cheated on you, which is in my case, um, you, you've, you've got to, um, you got to be willing to take ownership for your part of the deal. And on my side of things, it was just my emotional instability and went through a, tr a lot of counseling prior to the divorce that helped me tremendously start to understand that I was probably emotionally pretty, pretty revved up and, uh, had a temper and was really just, just fiery. And, and this had ran in my family. And I really, I don't, I don't know really what, at that point I don't know what I was angry at. I suppose obviously the, the, the relationship was dying. So needless to say, when I, when I, um, met my wife, I went into, f and, got divorced and took my time and kind of, I, I went into a full out massive depressive state, um, was a vegetable, was actually told by a counselor that he thought I was bipolar. I was so angry at listening to that diagnosis that I immediately, um, you know, fired him or left him and no longer saw him anymore. I had this stigma and this association with bipolar as being out of control and just being this horrible kind of diagnosis. Again, this is what people think um, and misunderstand about the illnesses that we face. So I then ended up, you know, just trying to pick myself back up. I lived at my parents' house and uh, one night decided to get on eHarmony, which is how I met my wife, and started to put the pieces back together, getting my life back on track, I guess, and was in a really good place, and was dating her, and everything was great, and she planned on then obviously moving to uh, where I live, and we did dated long distance, and when that occurred, I, my, the anxiety part of my diagnosis, the general anxiety disorder, just I was having panic attacks and anxiety attacks and I just was mortified to have her around and a lot of this had to do with what had happened with my last, my previous marriage and just how the brain chemistry, it's like my brain just short, it just changed. I just completely chemically changed as a person as a result of that traumatic experience, which is what I've read is common. That's what happens and can happen. So I was a mess. An absolute mess when my wife came to live with me and frankly uh, continued to have uh, I was a mess for the next seven and a half years I shared with a, uh, a gentleman that I used to work with that I had um, <laughs> I've really only started to have what I'd call a more manageable quality of life in the last couple months, guys. I mean, this isn't like I've been doing this for a long time. So I'm the, the, the rawness of the struggles and just the massive day by day, week by week issues are very real and, and are very, uh, not real, but, but, um, <laughs> they haven't happened that long ago. So I understand and appreciate how frustrating it can be more than you can imagine when things are not uh, ideal. And it was. I, I, I give so much credit to my wife for 
putting up with this because the the reality was is that I've was not a full you know fully functioning guy and spouse during the majority of our relationship and uh, it took me eight years to get my meds figured out that's a long time and I pray that none of you have that kind of duration because it's just massive I take eight medications I shared that that's a lot um, there's times that I look at my pill little you know cups that I take in the morning and the evenings and I'm just like dude it's really what I have to do and the answer is yes and as I've shared so many times the pills are just part of the equation but I think that has it been hard in my marriage absolutely are there times where my illness and my depressive spirals have um, because really my anger for the most part you know I can be irritable and angry with myself or with God <laughs> but as far as at other people's that kind of stopped that kind of that entire part of me like changed and I'm not like that anymore but in reality what I've become is a lot more emotionally vulnerable I cry very easily. Um, I'm sensitive, which is who I am. So I've chosen that over being angry. Which is a stigma, you know? I mean, most guys are supposed to be all rough and tough and, and rugged. And don't get me wrong, I'm tough. I'm, I come from, my parents were farm folk, so I, I know what it means to get through stuff and grind through things. But the submission to myself and to God and his plan is ultimately what has allowed this situation where for my wife and I God was in the middle of it always and had God not been in the middle of it I don't think we our marriage would have made it and I say that completely honestly totally a hundred percent with certainty and I know that my wife would say the same thing so as you think about your family think about the way your faith and the role that it plays because in the end, if it's about selfish motivation and how you think of what's in it for me and what I deserve and what I need, spin it around and say, even though you are struggling and you're on your ground, on the ground weeping, yet you pull yourself together to go back to your spouse and tell them how much you love them, even if they emotionally have been tough to be around or not as supportive. That's, that's what it means to have an agape, God-like love in the middle of your relationship. you got to step out on a ledge and not feel a sense of entitlement, but a sense of responsibility and a sense of emotional confidence that at the end of the day, all that matters is that God loves you. And you're not defined by what your friends or your family or your spouse say about you. And you have to remember that. And that is very hard. That is very, very hard. I'm, my, my wife is my best friend. And it's very difficult for me to deflect if there's times where, you know, we're having disagreements. And, you know, you say things. You both do. I mean, you say stuff you regret. You say stuff you shouldn't say. I mean, it's just... You have to work hard on this. Forgiveness is such an important part. Unconditional love. Saying that is one thing. To really, really... There's only one person in the whole wide world in the history of time that's been able to do that perfectly, and that's Jesus. His extension of unconditional love for us is beyond comprehension for many, and for, for myself as well. And I believe that because of our illnesses, guys... Because we have an emotional sensitivity, regardless of whatever the diagnosis is, we have a heightened sense, sense of emotional state that affects us in a variety of ways. That I believe in one of my other sessions, you have the ability to be compassionate. And it's hard to find that, but that is so important. If you want to have a strong marriage and a strong relationship with your family, you have to be able to find a place where you can love them unconditionally 
even if you're not getting the support that you desire or that you deserve. Because I promise you over time, I'll start to get it. Because they will see that you're trying to take responsibility for something that you have no control over. You know, we've got, like any other sickness, it pops up. It's there. It's a seizure. It's a moment where we've got to deal with it. And we can't, we can't be ashamed. And we can't be afraid to say, I know I can't control this. But I know that I can take some ownership on how I treat other people around me. And I promise you in doing that, that is how you save relationships. If we play the victim card too much, people are not going to respect us. They're going to see us as weak individuals. And we're not. We are not weak. That's the last thing we are. It takes tremendous strength and courage every day to deal with a mood disorder. And that's something that I want you to all remember and pat yourself on the back. That no matter where you're at, whether you have been an addict, I got a great comment commentary from a gentleman. Whatever you're doing, give yourself some credit. Don't always focus on the stuff that you've done that's negative. Focus on the positives. If you've been sober for so long, maybe it's you've just been taking your meds consistently for a period of time. Maybe it's that you're getting outside and getting some exercise. Maybe it's that you're, you know, having, you know, productive conversation and good dialogue with your spouse or your friends. Whatever it is, I know there's something positive that has happened that can be buried underneath all the, the emotional garbage and stuff that is just bringing you down. So I challenge you to find that. And I promise you, as you seek these things, God's going to be right there, and he's going to be helping you. And you, if you pray to him and ask him, help me find this stuff, he will help you. Because what you're doing is seeking truth. And this kind of truth does set you free. So my prayer is that, is that you find truth in amidst your relationships and continue to pray for your role and the roles of the others around you and how you can ultimately work together. I'm going to talk about a treatment plan later because that's another conversation that takes way too long and I've already talked for 12 minutes. But I'm proud of you for what you're doing. I'm proud based on everything I'm hearing. Keep on doing it. Don't give up. God bless.